we have uh, two uh, very distinguished and interesting uh, speakers uh, to talk about the, the webinar topic. Uh, um, let me first welcome Professor Tim Jenkinson from uh, the SAID Business School of uh, Oxford University. Uh, Tim is uh, a leading uh, researcher uh, in uh, uh, private markets. He has been uh, at uh, Oxford, let's say, for, for more than two decades. He has pioneered uh, interesting research collection of uh, uh, difficult to get data in private markets uh, and has published uh, uh, widely and uh, uh, very well in, in top uh, uh, finance and economics journals, won several prizes, uh, is, is, uh, has been uh, um, uh, building a, an extremely relevant uh, body of uh, uh, research uh, relevant to practice and has also taught uh, scores of uh, uh, executives at uh, uh, Said. So he also has a great network of uh, practitioners that uh, clearly keep him uh, up to date on whatever is uh, happening. Uh, Tim is also a consultant and, and uh, has been on several public committees. So it's kind of a perfect uh, uh, speaker uh, uh, on, on the topic. Uh, our uh, uh, second speaker is uh, Professor Pascal Boni, uh, who is the uh, managing director of the Tilburg Institute for Private Debt. Um, he has a doctorate from Tilburg University where uh, uh, he, he, he teaches and, and practices uh, 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 the, on topics mostly or related to uh, private debt. He's also in his uh, uh, second or first life, uh, the CEO of, of Remaco, uh, uh, a, an advisory uh, firm based in, in Switzerland. Uh, so I will uh, uh, ask a number of questions, and uh, but we also invite you uh, uh, from the audience to uh, participate and uh, to send questions uh, through the chat. I will moderate that uh, and uh, um, uh, make sure that uh, your questions get uh, to, to the speakers. Um, and before, just before uh, starting, I wanted to uh, notice that clearly the, the, the Institute is, a, is a, a, an initiative of, of the two departments at Tilburg, but it's largely supported by the contribution uh, of its uh, institutional members. And uh, I think that Pascal wants to make uh, an announcement in this aspect. Yes, that is true. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hello, Tim. It's a pleasure to, to have and hear you. Um, I would say I introduced two new members, not using more than maybe 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, as Marco kindly introduced us, uh, I think everything is set. But I want to uh, welcome warmly two new sponsors of the Institute. One is ICV. That stands for Independent Credit View, and this is a Swiss-based company, uh, basically in Zurich. It was the first independent credit rating and credit research institute in Switzerland, and is today offering monitoring services to institutional clients for both public and private market assets uh, in the fixed income sector. So welcome, uh, ICV. It's uh, very, very uh, positive to have uh, one new partner to the Institute, which also indirectly then finances research um, that can be used in both academia and practice. The second um, new partner is Asset Metrics. Also a warm welcome to Asset Metrics. Asset Metrics is a Munich-based asset servicing and analytics uh, provider. They offer modular asset servicing and analytics solutions to LPs and GPs. In that sense, Asset Metrics has a lot of data. Uh, they're currently uh, um, administering 1,500 private market funds. And I hope that if uh, what we provide in terms of research, uh, they like that they might be opening their uh, database to more researchers and at least TIPD, so we can gain new insights into the private market assets. This was basically the announcement. So a warm welcome and thank you to ICV from Zurich and Asset Metrics from Munich, which I believe also participate in the workshop and we will see whether they have questions to uh, Tim and myself. Back to Marco. Okay, uh, thank you. So then let's get uh, this started. And again, if you have questions, please uh, uh, put them in the chat and I will uh, uh, get them uh, to the speakers. Uh, so my first question, and I would like to, to ask uh, this starting with Tim is uh, uh, to start uh, with a, uh, uh, 
way that the, the, the private markets reward investors. So uh, the, the type of returns that investors can expect from private markets, uh, what are their uh, key characteristics, distribution, uh, uh, evolution over time, and uh, uh, relation to uh, public market returns? Tim, to you. Hey, well, that's a, that's a fairly big one to start off with. So th thanks for that. I mean, I think that, um, you know, when we're talking about private markets, we've obviously got lots of different types of assets we could be talking about from, you know, some of the most well-established private markets like venture capital, which was probably the first in some ways through buyouts, private, you know, so the private equity asset class, we've got real estate, we've got um, various forms of natural resources, energy funds, and more recently, we've got private debt, which is obviously very relevant to this institute, which is a, which I would say is a relatively recent phenomenon. And, um, and, and obviously, uh, I mean, at a very simple level, I think that these are essentially private versions of things which we also see in the public market space. So, you know, I, I've never been a believer that private equity gives you much portfolio diversification over equity. It's a form of equity. It's not a. It's not. A, it's not in some ways a different asset class. Um, it's a different way of achieving uh, access to that asset class. And I think, broadly speaking, the same is true of, of private debt. Um, and so, the sort of risk return characteristics, um, you know, are given by the the native form of the investment, if you like. But obviously there are some differences there um, in terms of if you want to look at the private equity side, clearly um, there might there are some differences between um, a portfolio of leveraged buyouts than, a, than public companies, uh, because not least because of the leverage on them. Um, they might also be investing in, in slightly different types of, uh, of companies, which are which are maybe less cyclical and more able to handle high debt loans and things like that. So I think there's definitely, you know, there, there, there are definitely some, a lot of similarities between the types of, uh, types of um, assets you can invest in on public markets, but there's also some, some differences. Now, when you're going to the returns, um, I think the, my personal view is, is the most sensible way to think about those is relative to their, public alternatives. Um, so we can talk about, you know, the, the sort of broad characteristics of the type of money multiples you can get back or IRRs you can get back on, on those assets, which is often the way that the industry looks at it. But personally, I prefer to look at it relative to, to the native assets, if you like, in the public market. And, and um, there, I would say that there is much more evidence on certain assets than others. And that's partly because of the longevity of how, how much experience we've got. Um, and, um, and to pick the two that I, I think there's the most evidence on, which is things like venture capital and buyouts, um, I think what you find is, is, is that um, the returns for buyout funds have been, I would say, um, good, uh, higher than public market returns, net of the not insubstantial fees and, and fees and profit shares that you have to pay on these on these funds. There's, from the research that I've done, there actually hasn't been a vintage year, by which I mean the year that the fund was raised, a vintage year in Europe where the median private equity fund didn't beat the MSCI Europe index. Now, you can argue with the MSCI Europe index, and maybe we'll do that. But from an institutional investor's perspective, that's quite a telling statistic um, that every single year you would have done better in the median fund because I'm not ascribing any, any manager selection skill there. That's why I choose the median. Obviously, if, you, if you're good at picking managers, you would have done even better. Um, and that's also broadly true in the US, although it depends a little bit more on the index that you use. Uh, in fact, the worst year for for leverage buyouts in terms of the when you the, the vintage year was 2008, which is sort of as you would expect, given that leverage was very high and then the financial crisis happened and leverage equity was not the place to be. So I think that in general terms, um, for, for um, the assets that we've got the most data on, the returns have been good and on the buyout side, venture capital has been a very different, a very different uh, situation where we saw 
exceptional returns before 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst, then a decade of actually very disappointing returns, uh, which gets us through to about 2008, 9, and since the financial crisis, the returns have been steadily imp improving and have actually been getting better than both public market comparators and buyouts. And so um, we've actually seen the, the best performing asset class for most of the last decades has been venture capital. Um, now I focused on the equity side just because there's the most the, there's the most evidence there, but and maybe I'll stop there and, and, and let Pascal get a a, a, a word in. Um, but because um, uh, on the on the debt side, but that would I, is the way is some initial thoughts on that. Yes, um, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim, for this. So, Marco, did you want to ask a question? No, 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 no. I just kind of okay, I'll, I'll keep it for later. Thank you. So, Tim, excellent introduction. I, I couldn't agree more. Basically, uh, the private markets, uh, to some extent, mirroring the public markets. However, as you already mentioned, there are there are differences. I think what I could add to what you said is that other than equity markets or private equity markets, private debt markets have performed, in fact, best in and after the financial crisis. So we see the highest uh, returns relative to public market um, and benchmarks immediately after the crisis. And, and that is linked, I think, to a question that we will discuss later, uh, and maybe reg regulatory and, and bank uh, cyclicality questions. So, but in fact, we, we observe, and there is a study that I did with a colleague, with Sophie Monigar, um, that these private credit or private debt returns are not much time varying. So they are uh, uh, mostly uh, larger than one. So in, in the measure of PME, so if you really compare to public markets, uh, the private markets outperform the public markets. We use, uh, of course, a bond benchmark. So the Bloomberg Barclays investment grade universe, and then you might argue, but the risk is higher. So we also use um, the high yield benchmark from Bloomberg. But most astonishing to me is the fact that the private credit markets also outperform the equity markets. They do not outperform the equity markets uh, to the extent that private equity does outperform the equity markets. But we find an average outperformance of even the equity markets, which are much more risky than credit, uh, by the amount of 6%. So that's the, that's the mean outperformance. Um, may be comparable to the private equity markets, a large dispersion between good and bad funds. Uh, so thinking in quartile uh, dimensions, the good funds really deliver much more outperformance than the bad funds, whereas the bad funds really do not deliver a large underperformance of the benchmark. So from that standpoint, um, very interesting returns as a general introduction. And I also wanted to say, yes, uh, private markets mirroring public markets, but somehow by construction, we have more inflation protection given, given the mostly variable coupons in the private debt industry. And we know from tips that they are, you know, like less uh, 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 co-moving with the market. So they have lower betas. And that is the case by construction across the whole credit industry. Maybe that explains the low betas, which are still to be explored in more research. But I think that is a distinctive, maybe a difference from equity markets. So we have, I think, low beta still to be proven in more research, but there are good indications for that. And outperformance of whatever benchmark we use so far uh, against the traded markets. Marco. Okay, th thanks, uh, uh, Pascal and Tim. Uh, I would like to elaborate a little bit more on, on, on your uh, answers in this respect. So you talked about the returns and, and clearly a big difference between uh, private uh, and uh, uh, public markets in this respect is uh, liquidity. So the fact that uh, it's difficult for, for investors to get back their money in a, in, in a short time. Uh, how does this, uh, uh, qualify the returns that you have uh, talked about kind of and how should investors think in that sense uh, uh, when they commit uh, they they think of committing money to to uh, private markets uh, maybe we will we can start with pascal now yes of course thank you um, liquidity is of course close to zero if you like for the private debt markets at least uh, but this ha this has a couple of of points uh, i need to mention here so first of all Many, you know, people confuse the, the seven to ten-year 
uh, duration or term of a private debt investment with zero cash flows. That's completely wrong. So typically, both in private equity and private debt, you will have cash flows that flow back to the investor after the investment period, which means like after something like three years, you will get cash flows. So you're not illiquid in the sense of not receiving any cash flows, but you are to some extent illiquid as there is no highly liquid market or not highly liquid uh, secondary markets for those types of assets. So, so that's a big difference. Um, also, I think a little bit incorrect, the comparison of the private debt or private credit markets uh, with the bond markets. So, so the wrong assumption from my standpoint of view is that bond markets liquid, private debt markets not liquid. I think that's, that's a misconception. If you look at off the run, so bonds that are off the run, so not like in the first year of their issuance in the high yield sector, you very often find very low liquidity for those types of bonds. So, uh, so we would compare basically a not very much liquid uh, private debt market with a maybe also not very much liquid high yield um, bond market. Third, maybe uh, mentioning is that there is a secondary market now building up. The, the premium that you see in secondary markets are relatively high, so, so it has a high price to get liquidity in the credit market. But I think uh, these, these uh, kind of spreads will come down once the market is more established amongst institutional investors. There are signs for that, but, but maybe we talk about that later and also don't want to steal too much time from Tim. So I would go Tim, over please. to Tim. Okay, so maybe I'm going to paraphrase uh, your, your question, Mark, you know, like how big should be the liquidity risk premium? And I remember when I first started sort of looking at the private equity industry back in the sort of day where when it was uh, uh, about 2000, when things were really start, just starting, people talk about 150, 200 basis points a year for, for an illiquidity premium. Uh, and, and so therefore, by that basis, you know, these days, that's about what private what the buyout funds beat the public markets by very roughly. So you might say, oh, well, this is this is not attractive. It's not attractive because it's not it's not comparing light with light because one's liquid, one's illiquid. The only thing I'd say is that this is an institutional market. Institutional investors have highly diversified portfolios. Most of them um, have five to ten percent in in private equity, maybe another few percent in private debt. Um, like, my question is, why do they need a liquidity premium at all? Uh, in the following sense, that as long as they construct their portfolio sensibly, um, they, there's going to be a lot of natural liquidity in that portfolio. Um, and if they need to uh, liquidate something and, and they've got plenty in you know, treasury bills or, uh, or, 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 or index, you know, index equity or something like that, I'm not so sure that many investors particularly value the liquidity anymore, the liquidity associated with equity. In some ways, I think that there was a, or, or with public market investments, in some ways I think there was a bit of a cult of liquidity that people really thought it was very important that you could trade it on a minute by minute basis. Um, whereas a lot of institutional investors are investing for a very long time horizon and actually don't particularly want, need liquidity. Um, and so, I, uh, what I'd say is that um, it's true that it's you make a commitment, which is a very long commitment, um, but the, these things uh, do throw off cash along the route and you're constantly having to make new investment commitments um, because they're not, they don't just hang on to the money for 10 years and give it back. They, they are throwing off cash the whole time. Um, and I would say that there uh, uh, certainly in the, in the private equity space, there is there are increasingly large number of ways to actually achieve liquidity. Um, but you can sell your interests in the fund, you can actually get intermediaries to, to let you get some money out by putting a preferred equity stake into the fund and, and you sort of sit behind it. There's all sorts of ways you can do it. But my fundamental question is, why, if I'm going along and talking to my university endowment and, and they say to me, you know, what, liquidity premium should we expect from which would we would need before we invest in private equity I, I i would be in the single digits of basis points not 150 200 i might say 
well, maybe five to 10. If you could give me five to 10 basis points over for a university that's been going 800 years, five to 10 basis points compounded is well worth having. Okay, that's so we should yeah. really take a century long perspective. It, it depends which investors we're talking about. If you're if you're a, if you're a pension scheme in rundown, not. But if you're a university endowment, why not? For sure. And then that, I mean, this kind of a, uh, before getting back to, to Pascal, I wanted to elaborate a little bit to and uh, relating this to what you were saying uh, uh, previously that you didn't see a structural break between private and public markets, which in a way may seem a a, 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 a strong statement. Okay, so now you you what you just said uh, started making this uh, clearer. So you you think about uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, one the possibility of structuring and understanding well the, the asset class itself, so that you know what to expect, and so you match it to some of your needs. And second, uh, I think kind of a, a, a related uh, issue is kind of a, that uh, um, there is heterogeneity across. Uh, uh, investors and so kind of uh, uh, certain investors may have kind of more of uh, uh, a, an easy way to incorporate uh, private markets in their portfolios than others uh, am i right yeah i think so i mean i think that you have to be you know you are making long-term commitments to these assets that you know you don't know what's around the corner and in 2021 you make a commitment 100 million dollars and you then you don't who knows what will happen in 2022 you know there might be a stock market crash there might you might find that that 100 million is a lot larger proportion of your portfolio today than or, or, or tomorrow than it was today and so there are some costs that are associated with this that where you could get your portfolios out of sync and i i do think that there are some you know there are that this is one of the reasons why most investors don't have you know huge amounts of these private assets because they are more difficult to rebalance but it does depend a bit about I think how you construct your portfolio, whether you have credit lines or not, what, what uh, David Swenson of the Yale Endowment used to call non-disruptive sources of liquidity is I think very important. Um, so this is, it, it adds some complexity to portfolio construction, I would say, but, it, uh, but I think that it's still right to think of these things as essentially in the same asset classes that you know, public and private equity are, are exposing you to the same sorts of economic risks. And, um, you know, if if bad things happen to the equity market, bad things will happen to the private equity market as well. And so it's, you know, they're both going to go down um, almost certainly. And uh, they're the same sorts of risks. So so certainly when I first started there, I heard some people justify private equity on the basis of portfolio diversification. Um, and I, I think that there's some argument for that with VC, because I think it's quite hard to get access to these days to, to publicly, you know, to some of those new technology ventures which don't hit the public markets for a long time. I think there's a, there is an element of that, but I really don't see it in buyouts, for example. I think most of the, if you wanted to get exposed to the same economic risks, you could do it in the public market perfectly well. Okay, sure. No, that's, I mean, certainly in that sense, that's what said, uh, venture capital is, is quite different from uh, uh, buyouts because it, it really addresses a different type of companies and with a different access to uh, uh, to markets, to private, uh, to public markets. Uh, uh, so uh, can, I, can, I add, yeah, yes. can I add maybe to what uh, Tim uh, uh, correctly just explained? I, I think there is there is really a big argument around this uh, liquidity question, and as Tim said from an asset liability management standpoint of view, these investors would typically not request liquidity uh, in the short term. So to put it a little bit more generally, I, I would say, what is really the utility an investor derives from liquidity if he or she knows that he, he's got, not going to use uh, that cash for a couple of years? So let me make a concrete example. If you can invest an IRR of roughly 9%, which is the running IRR that we see in the market in markets today. Uh, we all know that IRR is maybe a very bad performance uh, uh, measure as it is absolute and not relative to the markets, but still we do have this like eight, nine, 10% IRR in the market. So if you can allocate capital to a 9% uh, mean or 8.5 median IRR today, uh, 
should you not be thinking in terms of, of reinvestment risk as well? So, so if you have an eight to 10% return, don't you want to keep it for a, for a very long duration uh, in the sense that you, you would have to trade off reinvestment risk against liquidity premium, and then maybe the picture changes a little bit. So I think it's important to also think about uh, the liability needs that those investors have uh, in, in the sense that they need to serve liabilities. Typically, these investors are almost only institutional investors. So yes, of course, we should, uh, we should look at liquidity premium in the sector as well. But I think uh, if, we, if we ask from a utility standpoint of view, these investors really do not derive much utility from liquidity of an asset. Um, Tim, do you have any reaction to this, or can we? No, I think that I think that's broad. I think that's broadly right. I mean, there is a there is a question in chat, which is I think a good point, which is sort of you know the fact that that the liquidity, the sort of relevance of liquidity is when do, does it give you liquidity when you need it, and so that is and that is. That's sometimes called liquidity risk in the sort of academic literature, and um, and I certainly think that there is there is a sense in which you know the you can't uh, you can't rely upon certainly that that you, you're you're not necessarily going to see um, the cash when you want it. I'll give you one example of that. You know, we we would really want I think private equity funds to invest in equity when there's been a big market fall. Right. So that you might well say that's the real opportunity that you've got. Um, and so it might be that at that point in time, when you've had a big market fall or you've had a liquidity crunch like the financial crisis, you sort of don't want the funds to call the capital. And yet you've basically given them control of your checkbook, because if they send you a request on, you know, the day after the financial crisis in 2008 and they send you a request for 10 million dollars, you, you, you know, you sort of have to send the money. Um, and that could be a very good long term thing to do, because that's when the opportunities are, but it could be a very bad, it could really be painful for liquidity purposes. And so I think that there is, that's why I say that I think anyone who goes into this has got to realize that this could be the, that the, the, there could be big calls at times when you don't want it to happen. And that's why you need to have a non-disruptive source of liquidity, a credit credit lines, um, you know, a, a ability or a, in your mind, you're prepared to maybe in the short term, run down other sorts of assets, maybe go a little bit overweight on some assets um, and to be prepared to flex it. If, if, you, if you were to say, you know, all the time, we don't want to go beyond 60% equity or something. And, it, and, it's, and we, we view that as a big policy constraint then you should be very careful about private equity because it can push you above that. Um, but my, my basic point is that you can, you, that I think after the financial crisis, most institutional investors have got better at, at thinking about the liquidity risk. And, and much of that I think can be mitigated, I think. Yes, and uh, I think that with these uh, 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 points, you already uh, addressed uh, a question by Patrick, uh, from APG, which who was saying the ability to generate cash when needed. That's right. That was, what I, that was what spontaneous. That was a, yeah, that's what I was trying to answer. So I think it's, it is a good okay. point um, because it's not it's not liquidity. Liquidity isn't just throwing off cash. It's it's throwing off cash at the right time or demanding. Given that you know the capital doesn't get called until an opportunity arises, and you the the GP really does you know, control your checkbook um, or control your bank account because it will put money back into your bank account when it wants to uh, and take it out when it wants to as well. Um, uh, Pascal, you were about to say something or? or... I, I'm about to, to think about that. Um, <laughs> well, just to mention for, because I think it's interesting uh, that the premium that we see in the markets uh, and that you pay when you, when you basically, uh, dispose of those assets, sell them early in the secondary markets is something between three to six, seven percent. So I think there is good research on high yield bond markets that have comparable liquidity uh, cost. So, so I think, yeah, we have talked about it, but I just want to say this: this liquidity risk is there. That's obvious, and also the cyclicality of capital calls. 
is a big challenge, as Tim uh, rightfully mentioned. But it's not that it's a, a zero uh, or one game. So, so you can dispose of those assets. You just don't know exactly when that will be the case and what the price for it will be. And I think it's somehow comparable to the high yield bond markets, especially in a crisis when everybody wants to run to high quality. Uh, you will have a big ticket to pay when you want to get rid of a high yield uh, uh, below investment grade bond. So, so I think the comparison to public markets is, is correct, but it's not that it's a, a zero or one comparison, right? It's just an addition to the picture. Okay, let me let me bring up another question from, from uh, uh, Martijn Boons, uh, who basically points out that uh, given the very long uh, uh, time horizons, wouldn't be more appropriate uh, comparing cash flow rather than returns year on year uh, when we uh, make a comparison between private and, and public markets? Um, I, I think I understand the question. I'm not quite sure. If, if we were going to, so if you were going to return, look at the long term cash flows, um, you can, it's sort of getting us into the almost like money multiple sort of world, I think. I might, may have misunderstood the question here, but, but essentially, you know, what you get in a public, in, in a private equity market is, is remarkably um, sort of constant over time in my experience that generally speaking after all fees and carry for every euro you put into a, into a private equity fund you get between one and a half and two euros back if, in the median fund um, and so you know over long periods of time certainly cash is what people sort of care about I don't actually know what the figures are for the public markets if you did the same sort of thing I do know what the PMEs are which are doing pretty similar things public market equivalent returns because you are putting cash into the asset and then taking it out uh, when you, when you, uh, uh, you know, whenever you get a, a payback from the private equity fund, you, di you divest out of the asset. And there the, the evidence used to be uh, that, you know, in, the, uh, in early academic studies, including some of mine, we talked about a three to 4% more cash over time, sort of discounted cash as it were. And, and you also, um, but nowadays it's more like one to two percent more. Um, but again, I, I, I quite like the one dollar fifty to two dollars on the euro is a very tangible thing which pays pensions uh, and puts and put and pays professors. Um, but uh, you know, the I don't know quite what the equivalent would be. I suppose you just should work out the equity risk premium over a long period of time and accumulate that. Uh, but that's yeah. That, so that I, I hope that's sort of trying to get at the answer the answer to the question. I do think these long-term returns are indeed what you should look at uh, over the life of the fund. Pascal? Yeah. Yes, yes, if I understand uh, the, the question correctly, I mean, we should not forget, and I don't want to get too technical here, but the public market equivalent is nothing else than a cash and cash multiple with the cash flows discounted at the discount rate of the benchmark market. So in a sense, the public market equivalent, uh, which is above one. So if I say on average, a median uh, debt fund has, has a public market equivalent of 1.08, this means you basically get exactly 8% cash on the table and discount it to the market rate uh, that you use to benchmark. Uh, and in that sense, I agree, yes, uh, 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 you know, looking at cash flows rather then liquidity is maybe more important under the assumption and condition that you really are not dependent on the cash short term. So, but I think uh, public market equivalent pretty much solves that question if I, if I got the question right. Yes. Okay, so Martin, if, if uh, you want to elaborate on your question or if you're happy, we'll just uh, move on. There is another question which is related to, uh, uh, to these uh, comparisons of returns uh, from, from Liv and Bale is uh, what would be an appropriate benchmark to compare returns uh, with the different uh, private equity or private debt uh, uh, returns that you're uh, yeah. expert on? I mean, I'd say on the equity side, um, it, depends, it depends what you're, what, what you're looking at. Um, it, it, in terms of the buyout sector, you know, the, many people go with a sort of mid cap uh, market index, uh, the, the Russell, you know, 2000 or something like that in the in the US or, or a mid to small cap index in Europe is because the buyouts don't tend to be of the very largest firms. And so, you know, our, our sort of 
main market indices are dominated by by very different firms you know the uh, as we see with the s&p 500 having said that I, I suppose that you know if you're going to match it for risk that's what you do but there's also a big sectoral issue as well because you know there is the there's a debate going on at the moment uh, i think about whether the extraordinary but returns to venture capital actually could have been captured by investing in the nasdaq which has got a, obviously a very similar sectoral tilt to venture capital because whilst venture capital is not all technology it's got a lot of biotech and other things as well it does have a technology tilt to it and the nasdaq has been doing a lot be better than the s p 500 recently so it definitely matters which one you use uh, but i would say reasonable ones reasonable public market comparators are ones that are matched you know on similar firms at a similar point in their their growth cycle as it were and, uh, and and size and also to some extent by sector but it's it's difficult because different gps do different have very different strategies and you you might find one fund which is very heavily into old economy stuff and and the right benchmark or or risk risk adjustment for that which is sort of what we're trying to do would be different i think in the future we will have bespoke benchmarks where we'll know the, the each individual investment by the fund and this is this deal by deals uh, information is increasingly what investors are wanting to know for precisely this reason that you can sort of say you can much more easily assess whether the gp is adding value if you if you can benchmark it against sort of the closest comparable public firm or or group of firms than just using broad benchmarks but we're we're in early days on that uh, but it is where a lot of the data providers are putting huge amounts of resources to provide information at the sub fund level at the level of the individual asset which i think is also true in the debt side as well it really that is the new there will be a lot of research happening on on that type of deal by deal put within the portfolio sort of analysis i think yes yes if i if i can add um exactly what I think. I mean, the real challenge, and, and, and Tim said that already, is, is the risk matching uh, within the benchmark. And, and just to add to the picture, the average private debt fund has a size today of 1.3 uh, billion US dollars. So these funds are no longer these small funds that do small tickets. So an average loan then, if they have 20 to 30 loans, is, uh, is quite large. So it is also legitimate then, I think, to take public benchmarks. Uh, we would rather take maybe a leveraged loan index or a high yield index. Uh, surely, if we take the S&P 500 or maybe a composition of, of various indices, um, you do cover a lot of risk. Um, but I think it's also true to say, for example, in Prequin, we do see portfolio companies today. And you can sort of construct your own benchmark index, but it is also sort of not so informative because we first need to gain a broader knowledge as to whether these funds um, outperform those indexes uh, that we know. And then maybe in a second stage, we can go to, to customize index data uh, to measure our performance. But really the, the risk matching on, on the portfolio level is, is what's going on now more and more, but it's very difficult to get the right data. So in a way, do I understand correctly that you see a, a move towards uh, 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 more transparency, more information being provided uh, uh, from uh, the GPs up uh, to LPs uh, through, through the data providers or, or directly? And so is this changing also that the, may this be changing the nature of investments that are made and so kind of the, the type of uh, returns that the industry can provide to asset managers? If, if I can start on, on this sure, one, please, please. Um, because I'm just now, you know, conducting due diligence on a couple of funds and it, it's a yes and no. So if you look at the databases, professional databases, yes, they try to provide portfolio level companies such that you can get your own information on, on the portfolio. And no, because if you then talk to those uh, GPs and especially the good ones and the large ones, they're very reluctant to give you all of their data. So for example, if you say, look what I see on the, uh, on the commercial database is this number, can I please verify? They will like, oh, you know, of, of, of our last 100 investments, we will give you 10 examples. 
and you can verify those and then you say well how do you select the 10 and that's like okay you get ask for 10 and, and, and make some sample but they will only rarely give you a hundred transactions in terms of investment memorandums and all the details and partially because they're not allowed to do so at least that's the argument that these funds use so they say look by non-disclosure agreements we are bound not to give out the company level data that that, that we provided uh, capital to uh, but partially also i think at least for the very good funds they don't just don't have enough resources and time to give you all those details uh, we should know that at least for the private capital private debt side but i think it's also true for private equity maybe jim can comment on that there are huge amounts of capital flowing into the private markets and for the gp to give all the data in a time when they just receive huge amounts of investments into their buckets also economically doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense will it change over time i am sure it will be a different market in five years from now and we will have more transparency on the portfolio level but right now to get the real risk profile of an underlying asset is quite a challenge i think this is one of those areas where um, the industry isn't doing itself any favors by dragging its feet about transparency um, investors have a right to transparency. They should know what's going on. They should be able to, to look carefully at the full history of all the investments that were made. And because it's relevant here, because this is in many of these industries, it is a, it's a fact that, that the returns are really earned on a very few number of the investments in the fund, actually. It's certainly on the equity side. Um, obviously, it's, 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 it's true particularly in the venture capital space where one or two investments may return, make all the, all the profits. But it's also true in the buyout space. And of course, it's relevant to know that because if you have a fund that is, you know, that is, is not doing that, it's actually churning out, you know, 10% returns every year on virtually all its assets. That's very different from one which is turning out 300% returns on two assets and losing money on the others. You know, it has a different risk characteristic. And it's perfectly legitimate for investors to want to, to look carefully at the full, at the distribution of returns. Um, and, and I don't really buy most of the arguments about commercial confidentiality, I have to say. I think it's more about not wanting, you know, that it's always nice to talk about your winners. And you can bet in every single private placement memorandum, it will talk about the winners. It's a rare GP that says, Oh, and we also lost some money on these these couple, and this is this is why we did it, and this is why, and this is what we've learned from it. Um, it's that's not the way it happens, uh, I'm afraid, in most in most marketing documents that are put out there. But I do think that it's a legit it, it, that transparency has will increase over time because the investors will demand it. So, Marco, mm -hmm. if if you let me share just one sure. slide, it takes five course, seconds. Course, course. Can you can you see the, the yes. slide? Okay, so this is this is like the outcome. Tim was just talking about that. These are two funds that we're looking at, and you see uh, that the first one that these are gross IRRs at the portfolio level. So this would be a fund which has made two hundred and eighty-four investments, and the red bars are loss-making investments at the portfolio level, and the green and the blue bars are positive returns measured as gross IRRs. You see the green bars uh, within the credit bubble or GFC, um, the blue bar is after the GFC and underneath that the same picture for another credit fund which uh, basically was only uh, founded after the global financial crisis. But what you can see is there are very large returns after the crisis, especially for the second fund. And you can also see that the returns are quite balanced, what Tim just said, what I completely support. Um, so you would have, so we, we call this a win-loss ratio, only 1.4% of all investments would be negative and only 3.6 uh, for the second fund, still a good number, I believe. But we see the opposite as well. So we have just looked at one fund which had a 250% return on one investment and maybe uh, less so successful on other funds. So I think it is really important to look at, at the portfolio level when you, when you speak about a private debt fund return. Uh, very interesting, very interesting picture of this, uh, Pascal, indeed. Uh, and, but I mean, let, let me ask both of you something um, um, on, on what you just said, uh, um, which uh, 
Tim mentioned basically, uh, you, you, you were saying that uh, investors should know the way that GPs generate returns, whether through kind of a, a few uh, big winners or kind of a more uh, uh, equally distributed type of uh, uh, set of uh, companies. But this, does this in a way imply that you are thinking of a relatively uh, stable way or style or ability to, to capture returns by GPs that doesn't change over time? Yes, I think it's partly about performance persistence, you know, that if you yes. if you were going to say, do I have faith that this fund is going to do in its next fund as well as it did in its last fund, I would want to know what the distribution of the returns was in the last fund, because if they're doing this sort of stable investing and they they've managed to do that on 20 investments in one fund, then you probably you've got a high degree of probability that they're going to deliver it in the next fund Whereas if they're all over the place, you know, and they and they had a couple of real outliers then i would want to know who was responsible for those outliers which person in the fund had come up with that idea you know both the good and the bad maybe the bad ones they're not there anymore but the good ones maybe the people who did the really great deals aren't there either because they've gone and set up their own fund or something like that so i would want to i think you know i think all sophisticated lps try to get this information because they're trying to there's a lot of change and, and you know, development of spawning of new funds and things like that happening. And so, you know, it, it's quite important to, to track the, the deals to the individuals to the performance and not just think of this as being, you know, there is a brand associated with a, with a fund manager and just invest in that brand. Uh, don't worry about what's going on underneath the, the lid. You know, you should take the, take the lid off and look inside, I think. And so this, I mean, uh, uh, Pascal, you want to, you, did I interrupt you? Mm. Or no, 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 you didn't. I, I was okay. just coughing. But uh, at least I can give you a thought, uh, which was, was on my forehead. <laughs> uh, I think I couldn't agree more to what Tim is saying. So, of course, investors must know uh, um, the sources, basically, of their returns. But I just wanted to add, can you tell me which European bank gives you the credit portfolio details? if you buy the stock of a, of a commercial bank. So just adding to the picture, yes, of course, the private market industry is very opaque and new and, and generates returns. And yes, I agree, we must know uh, the source of returns uh, at exactly at the level of detail that Tim just mentioned, which I don't want to repeat. But still, very often times, investors are much harder on debt funds or equity funds, let's say, than they would be on, on a publicly listed uh, bank entity, for example. So, so we have a chance to talk to the top managers, which have typically worked for, you know, the Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, etc., banking world prior to changing over to a debt fund. And these are top people. So, if if you're an equity analyst and you ask for the the credit portfolio of a commercial bank, you will receive half of nothing from them. So just to, you know, to keep the apples to apples comparison uh, in the right place. But I agree, we should know more about uh, the source of, of returns, of course. And, and this, uh, in a way, this, this uh, type of uh, um, granular level information uh, means also that uh, uh, the asset managers themselves, as, as Tim was hinting, uh, need to develop the, the, the capabilities to, to do so, to interpret the information, which is, which is an investment. And that's something which is kind of a, clearly as its cost and at its benefits. But do you see that, that kind of this is also a, a, a trend in the industry that uh, asset managers tend to, to become more uh, uh, sophisticated and professional at this uh, uh, level of uh, uh, information interpretation? I, th I think there's, I mean, I don't think the asset managers themselves necessarily have to do it, but there, but there are intermediaries that there, there are data right. providers who are definitely doing this because there's there's real benefits from the sort of many to one relationship that that you want to have, you know, central almost like it's not just the funds I invest in I'm, I'm interested in, and I'm also interested in the funds you're investing in and Pascal's investing in, and like, and so I think that if you look at the big data providers, they're putting huge amounts of effort into doing this. Um, you know, a lot of the data that we use in academia comes from places like Burgess, where they have huge teams who are now dedicated to, uh, to, to gathering deal level data um, and, and tracking a lot more metrics over time. So I think, 
you know, that there's no doubt that the investors are going, I think that, and they're doing that because investors are asking for it. Um, so I don't think the investors have to do it themselves, but they have to, they, they, they have to uh, access that data somehow by, by access to data. Yes, and how about uh, private debt, uh, Pascal? Yeah, I think I think it's basically the same challenge for these uh, GPs. Uh, we should still also not forget that that some of these GPs are very much providing some sort of idiosyncratic transactions. So, so they might have five to ten excellent deal negotiators and deal makers. So I agree to Tim that you should be able to track the deal makers that they have. But it's sometimes also not the case that a loan is a loan or a credit is a credit. So there are all sorts of contractual uh, arrangements that they have in those funds. And they are or they provide good returns because those who structured and negotiated those terms are really good people sometimes, not always, but sometimes. So there is, there is a large idiosyncratic, I would say, firm-specific or GP-specific uh, structuring and negotiation asset that these GPs have. And in that sense, yes, they provide more data, but also it's kind of difficult to standardize that data, right? Yeah, definitely. So it, 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 uh, kind of, in a sense, kind of a, there, is, there is a premium to competence, whether it's kind of in-house in or uh, uh, outsourced and, and uh, uh, provided by, by specialized uh, companies which have uh, uh, access to, to, to large amount of good data. Um, uh, so that's, I mean, it's a very dynamic industry in that sense. Kind of, we can sometimes kind of, uh, I think that maybe people have this, some people have at least this perception that the, uh, uh, private markets are kind of something which is kind of has this very long uh, time horizon. It's kind of, it's a, it's a big elephant. But I mean, here we are seeing that it's an elephant with some gazelle type of uh, features uh, yeah. in a way. Um, so let, let me let me kind of uh, move uh, and let, let me also say uh, remind to the audience that kind of uh, questions are quite welcome uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, please uh, don't don't be shy. We are we are uh, happy to uh, include them. Uh, but I mean, let me try to kind of uh, uh, moving from looking backwards to, to looking a little, a little bit uh, forward, um, since also time is is, is flying. Um, uh, we are living in very challenging times, uh, economically and financially. Uh, the, we have seen kind of the, 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 the pandemic is clearly having uh, strong effects on uh, supply chains and, and uh, the way that uh, trade and, and finance are, are delivered. Uh, central banks seem to be changing their attitudes. Uh, 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 inflation seems to be uh, coming back. Uh, how do private markets in that sense uh, 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 offer uh, an interesting uh, um, uh, investment opportunity uh, 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 in, 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 in conditions kind of which are very different, uh, different from the 20 years of great moderation that we have been living uh, 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 so far. Do you see uh, uh, major challenges and opportunities ahead or kind of uh, you think that the, 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 industry, kind of the, the, the private markets in a way are uh, now uh, established and they will continue there in, in the same way uh, they are uh, role within uh, for, for the asset management industry hmm. team if you want to yeah uh, that's, a, that's a tough question i think i mean my, my general view is is that you know these these markets tend to go together as i said earlier so you know i yeah. don't think you should think of private markets powering ahead if the you know if the if their if their native markets are doing really badly um i i would say that you know that I, I've been constantly surprised at how low, how long the low interest rate environment has lasted. I, I, I can certainly see there's obviously inflation happening at the moment. Whether that is a one, a, you know, a sort of shock effect of the, of the pandemic, um, I think that's what most central banks are thinking. Uh, and as a result, we're going to have negative real interest rates for a period of time because I think the inflation yeah. certainly looks higher than the interest rate environment. Negative real interest rates are actually pretty good for le highly leveraged structures. Um, and so whilst you might say, oh gosh, you know, the, 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 the interest rates may be on the way up, which I, which I would, every, the economist in me says that must be true in the, uh, uh, over time. I'm, I'm not sure that the, the sort of combination of, of, you know, slightly rising interest rates, but maybe slightly higher inflation isn't 
sort of okay for the equity side. I, I guess to maybe a little bit less on the debt, maybe Pascal could say a bit on the debt side, because obviously debt is, is not inflation hedged in the same way. I mean, the, um, ultimately, I think this is partly about taking a view about whether you want to be in equity or not. And it's not so, so much private or public. I think it's, you know, do you think that the equity markets are, uh, are going to be a good place to be for the next five to 10 years? And that really is the tough question. I, I actually don't feel qualified to answer that. I think that uh, it's uh, all I'd say is I think most people, including me, have been surprised at how long equity markets have been going up for. I mean, after all, equity markets were extraordinarily strong last year. Um, and uh, if you look at the, and one manifestation of that is, you know, again, without wishing to look in our own backyards, you know, most university endowments have gone up 20, 30, 50% over the last year. These are, and that's really been driven by the equity markets, not private, not just private equity, but venture capital has been extraordinary. Anyone with very large venture capital returns has done extraordinarily well. Would we have predicted that if we'd known a pandemic was coming along? Probably not. So I actually feel quite humble at my ability to predict this. But I think it's more of a portfolio construction issue than a public versus private issue. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the only other thing I'd say, and again, this is sort of, again, a bit more um, judgmental and I, I can't point at evidence too much to support this. But I do think when people look at the venture capital returns, which have been extraordinary, um, and the amount of money flowing into venture capital, they're saying, you know, the older people are saying, uh, you know, is this another dot-com bubble that's about to burst? And I actually don't believe that. I think we're living through a, a, a period of almost unprecedented opportunity for technology and changes in the, you know, the sorts of the, 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 the way that huge opportunities for economic growth, actually. So I am quite optimistic about VC, even though there's, um, you know, there are very large sums of money going into it. I don't, I'm not one of those who feels like, oh gosh, the returns were really high last year and they're sort of unsustainably high and they'll go down next. But but I could be proved wrong. So so please don't bet your pension on my advice. <laughs> Pascal. <laughs> yeah, I would of course start with the same uh, request, don't bet your pension. But uh, maybe I start where uh, Tim just ended his, his thoughts. Um, Yes, I'm also optimistic for, for the, the private markets, but for maybe different reasons, be, because we have seen many drivers of this, of this market growth in the past, and they're not, not only driven by low interest rate uh, and then yield-seeking investors, they're also driven by much more fundamental developments. One fundamental development would be uh, the eclipse of the public company. So if you look at recent research, and I think that's confirmed that less and less it is attractive to have a publicly listed company for various reasons, which we cannot discuss here. But the attractiveness of being public versus being private um, has also changed, and it's less attractive to to capitalize your balance sheet uh, with public money. So that's maybe one large driver. And then there are other drivers. So we have the problems of pro-cyclical bank lending, which can at least to some extent be avoided. Uh, in the private markets, we have regulation in the banking sector, which really picked up increasingly in the last few years. So just to remind you, Basel III is just on its way to be implemented. So it's not that we're at the end of a development, we're in the middle of a development path and, and there is much more to come. Since I'm working in these work groups, uh, at least on, on the Swiss side, uh, I know there is much more to come on, on the credit side. So. So I think it's more than just yield seeking investors. There, there is a fundamental change from, from public to private. There is much more regulation to come um, for the banks. And looking at all, you know, like, you know, the bank tests, the, the shocks to bank equity and what they do, banks have basically reallocated their assets to asset-based lending. So cash flow based lending is no longer en vogue, if you like. Uh, and the gazelles, as you as you uh, called them, I like uh, uh, the comparison. The, the gazelles in in, uh, in in the private markets they kind of cope very nicely with that situation. So they profit they profit from those um, trends. Now coming back to your to, to your initial question, uh, monetary policy. 
I think also this might be a demand driver for uh, private markets. So first, as Tim already mentioned, there is negative real interest rates. Uh, and yes, uh, maybe even more so in, in the credit uh, uh, space, uh, fund level leverage is becoming a topic. So why should a fund with negative real interest rates not, not add more leverage to a very attractive asset portfolio uh, uh, and adding returns uh, from the leverage effect by doing that? But also on the other side, I think the monetary policy situation will create more pressure um, on the banking side. I mean, we have seen government bailouts of banks and, and I think there will be an end to that in the next few years. We have seen uh, basically that government bailouts lead to eroding values um, on, 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 the, on different levels. And this creates a lot of trouble to, to bank regulation, but also to the interbank lending markets, to the interbank lending markets would be a, a webinar on its own um, and higher funding costs. And, as there are, you know, like to some extent distorted what I expect, interbank lending markets and higher funding costs, these banks will, will face increased cost of lending. Whereas a typical debt fund is 100% financed or refinanced by institutional investor money. So they don't have the regulatory pressure. They don't have any leverage constraints, at least uh, not regulatory leverage constraints. And I think this will further increase the demand for private market assets. Uh, thank you, Pascal. And and so, in, uh, uh, let, let let me ask uh, um, uh, to both of you uh, the following. Kind of, a, it seems that kind of a, you you seem to to uh, sort of agree on the fact that uh, uh, public or private is to some extent an issue of structuring in, in terms of the uh, of the investors' portfolio. Uh, so it's not such a a, a a big issue. So is this a kind of good news or bad news? Uh, for uh, uh, the uh, GPs and 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 uh, kind of uh, and people in in uh, in industry, in the sense that it seems that uh, from what you say, one interpretation could be that uh, uh, asset managers uh, would should find it relatively sim kind of not simple but kind of accessible to enter in in uh, uh, into private markets in uh, with with large uh, allocations. Uh, if they are willing to pay the cost of, le of learning or, or outsourcing some some knowledge, uh, would you? So, in the sense, would you foresee a possible very large uh, growth of uh, uh, private debt and private uh, equity um, amounts managed, or not? I think over time, yes. I mean, that's what's what that's what we've been seeing. I mean, it is more complicated. You're having to enter into partnership agreements typically you need a, a, a better legal capability you it's a bit more difficult to monitor you know you, the due diligence is quite is quite um, significant so I think that it's not that you know some some investors I think feel like they have an in-house capability to do that others will go via intermediaries I, I think that sort of modern day fund of fund, what we might call fund of funds they're sometimes called solution providers now or the like who can do this at scale makes perfect sense having intermediaries who can do that. And so I think in general, um, the costs of going into private markets are going down, even though the cost of private markets is still high. Um, in other words, in terms of the fees and the profit shares. So the, the end of the day, it's all down to returns uh, because if the returns aren't good enough to pay those costs or if competition gets so hot that the returns go down and then the and the net returns aren't attractive, then you know that's what that 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 will be the the thing that constrains this industry, uh, essentially. Um, or whether there's innovation on the cost side, I, I very much hope there is. I think there are some different models, certainly on the equity side, where there's no particular reason why the 1990s or 1980s two and twenty model needs to persist. Pascal. Yes, yes, I agree. But let me give some numbers on the credit side to these thoughts, uh, maybe to think about the equilibrium or so. Um, the credit market today is like 1.2 trillion US dollars. And it's, it's always interesting to, to relate that to something we all know. And I guess uh, almost everybody maybe in, in the chat here or in the webinar knows that the leveraged loan markets in the US is something like 1.3 trillion. 
So it's not that that the credit market, as we see it, private credit market is is a market, you know, in its in its early development. Uh, it's it's a very large market already. So it compares in size to the U.S. leveraged loan market, uh, for which we have, by the way, much more research. The U.S. high yield bonds market is 1.7 trillion. So we are talking about about market sizes which are very much comparable um, to private debt. And let me just share. One slide here to put that also into perspective. Can you see the chart, Marco? Yeah. Okay. If what Prekin has asked here in a poll uh, for, for different asset segments, let, let me just go to pension funds. So if this is right, Prekin asked, okay, from your today's asset allocation into credit, which is roughly 2%, let's say, where do you want to be in the near term uh, future? And these pension funds said, we want to go up to 5%. So knowing what the pension fund uh, asset pools are in size, if you only look at the US, this would mean an increase of the credit market by 500 billions. So, so this is already like 30 to 40% increase of the market in, in, in the near terms. So I think, yes, it is true to say that the market is already quite large, but you know, what if all the other asset allocators also maybe allocate some of their money to private markets. So I think there is a lot of room to grow in the next few years. And it, it's, it's a quite important market already. Uh, thanks, Pascal. And let, let me uh, kind of push both of you back a little bit on this in, 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 in the following way. So if, if uh, uh, um, the, the private markets were to uh, increase so uh, dramatically as 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 uh, as you seem to to think could happen, uh, wouldn't this be a very strong pressure on the managers of of these investments to to deliver uh, value? Um, would there, would there be kind of uh, uh, enough uh, quality and uh, uh, talent uh, uh, that could be deployed? over kind of a relatively short period of time? Or, or is it something which is really going uh, very uh, constantly, but, but more slowly? What, what, do, you, what do you expect, uh, well, Tim? Or pa Pascal, yes, please, you, you are already had. I, I think I wanted to ask Tim because he has the longer time series with uh, private equity. And I think yeah. he's gonna explain in more detail than I can that over time, the returns have become less stable or or maybe uh, for segments uh, changed over time. But I, I leave that uh, answer to Tim and then I can co come back uh, to credit if there's anything to add. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, that you know, if money, if, if, if investors pump much more money into these, into these funds, they've got a bit of an issue, which is, do they do more deals or do they do bigger deals? And generally speaking over the, in the certainly in the buyout space, it's been bigger deals. And so the money, the money has been deployed in bigger deals and it's, and it's not been too hard to do that because they had, you know, they, it just sort of expands the universe of companies who can be subject to private equity involvement, as it were. So it hasn't been the biggest issue. I think those bigger deals are lower risk, lower return uh, in general, um, which is fine. Low risk, lower risk, lower return is, is good. Um, uh, there's perfect market, you know, there's perfect demand for that. But I think it's 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 been it's been possible to to do that. Whether the on the venture capital side, I think it really does come down to the thing I was talking about earlier, which is are there lots of innovative opportunities at the moment, uh, and and that's where I'm optimistic because I think there are. Um, I think there's all sorts of opportunities. I don't need to go through them. The normal candidates in the you know AI, biotech, you know autonomous vehicles, you know lots of different things, lots of different areas which can sort of which which will change life and will change the economy and i think those are the places where a lot of capital will be will be invested not all of it um not all of it profitably i mean after all we've only got to remember uh the clean tech sort of uh, uh sort of flurry led to lots of good innovation but not great returns for investors sometimes the these returns are more on the on the um the consumer side I'd say one other thing before I finish. I think that the other thing that we, we haven't really talked about for a bit, but is going to come into play a lot, is um, is the opportunity for investments in uh, if, what you might call the carbon markets. That you know the 
the demand for investors for carbon negative or you know sort of innovations which take carbon out of uh, that, that that help deal with with uh, climate issues. Um, and I, I keep those separately from me from other ESG areas because I think the climate is the thing that a lot of investors are really focusing on. I think those are huge and, and will be um, you know, all sorts of opportunities there for funds to be raised, which look, look very distinctly at buying assets, which can then be sort of used to ha- help overcome some of the, is- uh, the, the, the issues to do with, with, with climate change. Definitely. And, and uh, Pascal? Uh, yes, agree you again. Want... I, I agree yeah. again. Well, I, yeah. I just wanted to say we, we talked about, or, or Tim did talk about the persistence very shortly. So the study that I just did with a colleague is like, we find high persistence. So it's, it, it's statistically significant across all segments. So we find this persistence in, in, in a GP's performance from one to the next to the next fund. And I think this is a little bit different with some of the private equity sub strategies of which Tim knows more than I do. Uh, but I think this was all also uh, only detected over time. So I think persistence in the, in, in the first few years, let's say 15 to 20 years of private equity was quite high and then diminished to some extent for some uh, uh, sub investment strategies like venture capital, I imagine, but, but maybe you can add to that uh, later on. Um, but I wanted to say, in, in, in the sense of, of Tim, I think, yes, low risk, low return might be a possible development in the credit markets as well. But I think the investor is, 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 is advised, uh, is, has good advice if he really thinks about what is a typical private debt or private equity transaction. And, and if these funds really go into the mainstream lending business, I think it's just like comparable to, to, to bank credit, for example, in, in, in the case of debt, uh, we will not see any market uh, outperformance anymore. So, so it's really maybe a good starting point to think about the strategy of a GP and why he is able to generate excess returns um, and then continue from there. So we must be careful to put it uh, in another way that we don't label this like, okay, private markets always have a high return. Um, it really much depends on what is done in the specific portfolio. Very good. <clears throat> Very interesting uh, perspectives. Um, now, there is kind of a, 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 a fascinating question from uh, Sophie Manigar that uh, uh, also relates to uh, recent uh, developments uh, in, in regulation. And Sophie asks whether we uh, whether should... Uh, the regulation for institutional investors and for retail investors uh, somehow be relaxed and converge in a way so that we can, we should kind of de- democratize or allow more uh, generalized access uh, to private markets. Uh, they, in, in September, the, the, a, 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 an expert panel advised the SEC in the US to, to go in this direction, for example. And uh, every now and then we, we, we have this, uh, 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 type of calls for uh, uh, more uh, um, uh, better access for uh, a retail investor or for smaller ticket investors uh, to uh, to these asset classes. W- what are your views on these? Well, personally, I think in general, yes, but you have to think very carefully about the way that retail investors can get access to this because a retail investor is not like an endowment fund. You know, retail investors might well have liquidity shocks, need to liquidate their wealth, to buy a house, to deal with a family crisis and things like that. And so I think that there are good and there are bad vehicles to get access to private markets. I think that, you know, you, 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 it doesn't make much sense to, or, or, it, or rather you'd have to think really carefully about whether they could invest on a similar basis to an institution investor, i.e. tying their money up for up to 10, 12 years, getting cash flows back when, 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 only when the GP sent it. But there are other alternatives here. So, you know, uh, for example, I'm, a, I'm actually on the board of, a, of an investment trust in the UK, which has 50% private assets, 50% public assets. You can, you can buy shares in it. Um, well, I think you can buy shares in it if you're in Europe. I'm not quite sure anymore <laughs> whether you can. It's a London listed fund. 
Um, but uh, you know that structure is a closed end fund. Uh, closed end funds are a good way to invest. You can always get your money back on the day, but it's but you have to you will bear some risk if the if the private the private assets are only revalued every quarter. The public assets are done every day, but it's a it's a mixture. Uh, there's there's a number of these. Um, those are ways which you can currently get access. I think that some of the link ups between some of the the big asset managers, there's you know that uh, um, who are looking at expanding into private assets. All the all the names you you will know about. The very largest ones are exploring this now. The the regulatory question is actually as much about things like pension fund. Uh, regulation. So, for example, should you be allowed to, you know, in your defined contribution pension scheme, should you see some assets which are private assets? And I would say yes, but but they should say loud and clear on the tin that you can only trade these periodically, maybe once a year or something like that. And you should go for you. Know, you should be very clear that these are not liquidity you know, based instruments, you know, they're, they're sort of ones that you have to commit to for a long period of time. But in general, I would say, yes, it would be good to, to um, open this up, but in a way which is, you know, pension schemes are by their nature, they should be illiquid because we're investing for the future. But if you're investing in, you know, for more on the sort of, not outside a pension wrapper, I think that things like investment trusts or other vehicles like that are actually maybe the next step to take. But then isn't it a little bit of a contradiction uh, which can generate a, a, a false uh, sense of security, the fact that you invest in a, um, a let's say, in a traded fund, uh, which invests in, 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 in also in, in uh, private markets. And, and so that you can, you think, uh, as you say, kind of, I mean, you can, uh, 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 you update uh, the, the, the private uh, values uh, quarterly. And that's also kind of a nominal update in the sense that it's still nominal until they are realized. Uh, uh, and so that people may think, hey, yes, I'm kind of, I, I have a daily price for this, which is in a way it's, it's not really true. And so this may kind of might generate a, a sense of security. Yes, I can trade them any anytime. Whereas kind of to make, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, achieve the full value, you may have to wait uh, uh, quite some time. Yeah, well, this is kind of a, a, a kind of a, a, a challenge, a, a difficulty. Yeah. In some ways, but you can literally trade them every day. It's just you get yeah. the you 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 get the market price, and the market yes. price may not be the the same as the net assets of the fund. So you know they that you're right that you have to you know these these sorts of vehicles. You need to understand them, and you need to understand. You know, if you're paying less or more than the, the, the net assets of the fund, you've got to understand why that is. But I do think, I, I mean, that there are lots of different versions. I think there are lots of different ways that you could do, do this. Uh, fund to fund structures, which have sort of uh, credit lines or liquidity lines that are built into there, which will allow people to trade. Those could make a lot of sense as well. What, we, what we've learned, I think, over the years is that like USITS type funds, you know, the, the the you know, EU regulated mutual funds, if you like, which allow a small slice of private assets are, you can only allow a very small slice because otherwise they can blow up. And we saw yeah. that in the UK with the Woodford funds, which were the sort of, you know, the, the, the nadir of this type of, of decision. But on the other hand, we see it happening in the US with the big mutual funds. They're, they're big, they're big yes. investors in venture capital and the like now. Um, yeah. It seems to work sort of okay. Maybe you could start expanding that a little bit, but you might need to then take the reduce the amount of you know whether you can trade every day or you have different asset classes which say well for the for the daily trading one we're not going to invest in more than five percent of private assets, but for one which will go up to twenty percent you can trade every three months. Um, I think you have to accept that there will be trade offs here at the yes, retail definitely. Uh, Pascal. What, what's your opinion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, much, much is already said, but I think I'm, I'm as a Swiss, it's very hard to be uh, non-democratic. So the question was, <laughs> should, should, should we bring more democracy into this asset segment? I think uh, it's hard to say no, but I, I would rather say no than yes. Uh, why is that? I think the only legitimate way uh, 
to, you know, to structure this asset in, in, in the sense that it is uh, more accessible to smaller investors, in my opinion, would be to structure it for liquidity. So to the extent that we search more liquidity in the market, I think uh, that is a good thing to do. Um, and then on, on the other side, if, if you put a wrapper, whatever the form of the wrapper is, be it a listed fund, be it, be it uh, uh, whatever, can be an asset token, etc. We, we have to be aware that typically a GP will not even let you invest into a fund if you have a retail sort of profile. So it might be that you have a big chunk of money that you allocate in a structure that is then recognized as an institutional fund. But we also have to be aware that, that all of the banking regulation, which we see in the market goes exactly into the opposite direction. So every thinkable risk that a retail investor could face in its uh, you know, most imagination he or she could have is, is tried to be eliminated by paper regulations, rules, uh, checks and balances. So I think while, while there might be more liquidity by, by some structures for institutional investors, uh, it might be too early to, to try to democratize those assets. There are plays in the market. Uh, I'm sure Tim, Tim knows them. Um, they're in the Financial Times almost every second day for private equity. And their big argument is let's democratize private equity. Um, yes might be, but as, as we also said, there is a parallel development between public and private equity markets and debt markets. And if the public markets uh, you know, have a crash, the private will also have to some extent a crash. And we will say, we'll, we'll only then see how retail investors might react to those sorts of assets. But let's say I'm skepti skeptical, we, we will have structures that will allow investors to go lower in terms of ticket sizes, typical private debt ticket for a GP is 10 million upwards, maybe five if you're a good negotiator, um, but to go down to 10, 20, 30,000 K for an investor is, is really an ambitious target, if this would be the target. So I would say one has to be very careful and, and consciously exclude retail investors, uh, unless they are protected by a very knowledgeable manager, which might be the pension fund manager, for example, who knows what he or she does. So I would really delegate that decision to a professional manager. And then yes, if there is no need for liquidity or by construction, the investment vehicle is not liquid, then I would be positive, but, but not otherwise. Thank you, Pascal. Um, so time is, is getting uh, close to uh, our uh, ending time. So. Uh, let me ask a final question, which goes back to, the, let's say, the, the, the mission of uh, uh, the, the Tilburg Institute for Private Debt, which is bridging research and, and, and practice. And so let me ask the, the, the speakers who are uh, quite active researchers, what do you think that research will bring uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, few months and years uh, to practice in terms of new results and uh, uh, new ways to kind of uh, think about uh, the way that they are operating. Is there something that you can see coming? I mean, I, 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 since it's, um, I could come up with lots of different examples, but I think the one that I would focus on is I think that over the next few years, we'll get a much better understanding of risk. Um, I think we've got a lot of good understanding of return and relatively little good understanding of risk and i think that will come through understanding the getting this data at the level of the portfolio at the level of the deal and i think that's where the biggest advances will be made which will be of relevance to to investors and, and industry well indeed i mean the, it's it's a job market time for finance departments and and uh, yes as i was actually uh, looking at a job market uh, a paper by a candidate was uh, exactly doing this kind of trying to, to uh, quantify risk at the, at the individual uh, yeah. company level so that's definitely uh, going to happen yeah. uh, Pascal yes I mean let me remind us that we have a 1.2 trillion asset class I'm speaking of private debt which has almost no research available to the investor even if it's a highly professional institutional investor so yes we have a good understanding or start to have a better understanding of returns we have 
not so much a good understanding of risk. So I completely agree to Tim. And we also should keep in mind that risk in, in the private markets area has three levels. There is a GP level risk, there is a fund level risk, there is an asset level risk. And at the asset level, which is really what you buy in the end, this is almost a complete black box as of today. There are some data providers, there are some, you know, some studies, but in the sense that we could, could really say that this is the market and this is how it is in a generalized form, there is much to do. This is why we have this research institute and I'm sure that also uh, Tim is highly motivated to research more on the asset level uh, on the private equity side. And it will be interesting to see what commonalities we find between equity and debt and what differences we might find in terms of risk uh, analysis on these three levels. But I agree, uh, risk must be explored in much more detail. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. So if, if uh, uh, let me see if, if there are additional, any additional uh, uh, question from the audience, that's uh, uh, your last chance to, uh, to put it uh, so that we can close with, with a, a, an audience question if, if there are any. Um, otherwise, I mean, we are kind of, uh, I think that we had a, a, a very intense and uh, stimulating discussion with lots of uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, inputs. Uh, and as, as Tilburg Institute for Private Debt, we are here exactly to bridge research and, and practice. And uh, uh, we look forward, this, this is, uh, uh, tell me, correct me if I'm wrong, Pascal, but this is our last webinar for uh, the current year. Uh, so we'll be back uh, next year with uh, uh, new events, uh, bringing uh, new research. Uh, and we have here in the audience some uh, PhD students who are working on uh, uh, related topics, uh, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, back soon. Thank you very much to the audience. Uh, uh, in the first place, we'll put uh, the recording uh, of the session on our website uh, quite soon. So you can go back and listen back to any uh, passage which uh, you think uh, it's particularly interesting for you. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, uh, from coming uh, uh, through the channel <laughs> uh, <laughs> virtually to, to join all of us and to all of you who have come from, uh, I know from very different countries as well. It's, uh, uh, I mean, one good thing of the pandemic that we have had is to, to, to make this type of events possible, which uh, uh, would have been unthinkable just uh, two and a half years ago, and now are kind of uh, uh, quite, uh, quite effective and I think uh, quite enjoyable. Uh, thank you very much, team. Thank you very much, Pascal. And uh, again, thanks for the audience and see you in 2022. Thanks a lot.